All right. So I want to ask a question, a series of questions, really. Um, it's under one big question. Have, hands up if in your lifetime you've ever changed your mind about something. Anybody that you've changed your mind about something. For instance, hands up if you change your mind about your favorite color. Right? So you changed. Some of you changed from blue to brown. Anybody, anybody with brown here? If brown is your favorite color, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Yeah, God, anybody, God bless you too. You guys, blessed are the eyes that see. If you don't see that brown is the favorite color in the world, I don't understand where you're coming from. What about favorite song? You used to say, this is my favorite song of all time. But now it's actually this one. How many of you even changed it this year? Right? You changed it this year. May God bless you and deliver you from instability. How many of you have changed your favorite food? Favorite food. You changed favorite food. How many of you have changed your favorite film or series of all time? You've changed. This one is the most important one. How many of you have changed your favorite preacher in, ch in City Church? Good, good. No, keep the hands up. Keep the hands up. How many of you have changed that preacher to Femi Oshunui? How many changed to being Femi Oshunui? So, okay, so that means you changed away from Femi Oshunui. <laughs> Out of curiosity, because we were in membership class yesterday, and a friend, somebody I've known for 27 years, told me, no offense, so Femi, it's just that, you know, there's a, I feel like connect more with Tommy. I said, Tommy, eh. So this is how, this is how you pay me back. How many of you think, is, is it Tommy? Who is Tommy? Yeah. If you keep quiet. You have been, okay. You're down for, they are the ones plotting it. How many of you, is, is it Emmanuel? Emmanuel. Uh, uh. So, that one, no, no, that one doesn't sound like that. No, it sounded like Femi has slain hundreds, Tommy has slain thousands, and Emmanuel has slain ten thousands. <laughs> you will start your own church. It will not be here. You know, we are free to change our minds. You know why we change our minds? Because sometimes the evidence of the thing changes. Evidence of what we thought was made this thing our favorite thing, it changed. And so we are free to change our mind. Maybe I can take it deeper, though, and ask you this question. How many of you in your lifetime have changed your mind on something about God, something about Christian teaching? How many of you? You think it's right to do that? Yeah. And the reason why I think we're all saying yes is because in some instances, to change, even on things like, especially things in Christian teaching, to change is a sign of maturity. Because, don't get me wrong, it is true, if you change so frequently, it's a sign of instability, and that's a sign of immaturity. But if you do not change at all, that's a sign of rigidity or inflexibility. Both instability and inflexibility are signs that you are not maturing. And let me tell you what Christian maturity is. Christian maturity is being led by the Spirit, however he leads, to follow Jesus wherever he goes, to bring us to the Father wherever he is. Emmanuel and Tommy can't give you that. <laughs> but I'll say that again, it's really important. What is Christian maturity? It is really being led by the Spirit, however he leads, to follow Jesus wherever he goes, to bring us to the Father wherever he is. Whenever you start your Christian journey, and it is a journey, you have not reached the destination. We know that the destination ultimately ends with God. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It surely ends there. But the road to get there, we don't know. And God deliberately doesn't tell us everything at the, stand, at the beginning because we will not be able to handle it. So Christian maturity, when you start to change, it reflects the fact that you are going on that journey, you are listening to God, and therefore the things that you thought before, you don't always think them now. God reveals new things to us, but sometimes God corrects old things. Amen. So turn to your neighbor and say, give yourself some charity. And then turn to your other neighbor and say, give others charity. And can I say, give your leaders charity too. Whether in the church or outside the church, because I'm going to ask for some charity today. 
So when it comes to the issue of fasting, I've changed my mind a few times in my Christian work. Because I wouldn't like to have had a mixed relationship with fasting. And some of us here have also similarly had a mixed relationship with fasting. Many of us have been served the periphery of fasting as the main course. And what we see in the passage today is that Jesus tells us what the very center and the core of fasting is, its very main course, so that we do not embrace damaging views about fasting. Are you following me? Now, if you are able to understand that, can I make a statement that I have come to a conclusion of having gone up, down, east, west regarding this thing? Listen, fasting is a non-negotiable Christian discipline whose exclusion from your normal life will deprive you of vital spiritual growth. It's a non-negotiable Christian discipline. If you exclude it from your normal life, it will deprive you of vital Christian growth. Now, may I know some of us will be disagreeing at this point, and I suggest that maybe we've had a mixed relationship with fasting. And I pray that with today's sermon, that God will start to change and correct all, all damaging teachings in our lives today in the name of Jesus Christ. I really do pray that God will renew a hunger for him in such a way that nothing becomes impossible for you to forego just so that you can have him. Lord, do that this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, we'll consider this sermon we've titled, Hungering for God, under these three headings. Disastrous fasting, desirous fasting, and generous fasting. Someone a few weeks ago asked me, when are the three-point sermons coming back? Sarah, do you have your answer? So let's start. Desire, uh, disastrous fasting. You see the text there in verse 18. It says, when the disciples, now the disciples of John, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, some people came and asked Jesus. How is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Now notice the people came to ask, because fasting in Israel at that time was mainstream. It was mainstream in the culture. What do you mean by fasting? Let me just give you a very quick definition of fasting. It's a spiritual or religious decision to forego regular food for a period of time. It's a spiritual religious or religious decision to forego regular food for a period of time. And can I quickly just throw out there, if you are saying, no, how about foregoing social media? That's abstinence. It's not fasting. Traditionally and everywhere you can see, fasting has always had to do with food. Abstinence is a good thing. It's just not fasting, as the Bible would say it, okay? So it was very mainstream in, Jewish, in the Jewish community at the time. And when I say mainstream, I mean in the culture. It was just a regular thing. That's why here, it is not the Pharisees that are doing the questioning. In the last two passages that we've seen in Matthew chapter 2, it was the Pharisee teachers of the Lord that are questioning Jesus. At this point, it is the people, says some of the people. You see, it was so mainstream that a few centuries before that, in fact, they used to fast twice, two months out of the entire year. Zechariah 7 verse 5. It says this, that... Ask all the people of the land and the priests, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh months for the past 70 years. Was it really for me? They were fasting two months of a year. Some of you are making noise that all these churches that fast in January. Two months. So it was so mainstream. Now, why was it mainstream? It was because they would have recognized that at least under the Old Testament, as they read the scriptures in the Old Testament, that the reason for fasting could broadly be categorized into two big classes. Two big classes, reasons for fasting. One, repentance. Second one, breakthrough. One, repentance, breakthrough. So look at, for instance, repentance. It could be personal repentance. It could be collective repentance. Personal repentance, you can see Ahab. Ahab, disaster is about to come on Ahab. The word of the Lord comes to Ahab through Elijah. And then what happens? Says, he says, I'm going to bring this 1 Kings 2, 21, 21, 29. He says, I'm going to bring disaster on you. I will wipe out your, descend your descendants. Ah, voila, 27. When Ahab heard these words, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and fasted. 
And thereafter, and he went around meekly, and verse 29, because he has humbled himself, God says, I will not bring this disaster in his day. Repentance. But it's not just individual. That repentance, you can also see it nationally. You remember the famous one in Jonah. Jonah sends the word of the Lord to Nineveh that they're going to be destroyed. You know what happened in verse 5? The Ninevites believed God, and a fast was proclaimed, and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. What was the result? Verse 10. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. But also it could be for a breakthrough. They are in a particular condition and you bring fasting into the situation to be able to cause a breakthrough in that situation. It could be for intercession or it could just be for petition. By intercession, we're talking about praying for other people. So Psalm 35 tells us this. Yet when they were ill, I put on sackcloth and humbled myself with fasting. When my prayers returned to me unanswered, I went around mourning like, you know, um, uh, like uh, my mother or something like that. The point is this, yeah, mourning as though for my friend or my brother, I bowed my head in grief and all of that. That's intercession, praying for somebody. Pray until something happens, but you mix fasting with it. But it could be for petition, whether it is a personal petition or we corporately. So like, the people in Ezra's time wanted to go through a particular place. There were enemies all around the road, and he didn't want to have, ask the king to send him soldiers. Why? There, by the Ahava Canal, I proclaimed the fast, so that we might humble ourselves before our God and ask him for a safe journey for us and all our children with all our possessions. 22. I was ashamed to ask the king for soldiers and horsemen to protect us from the enemies on the road because we had told the king the gracious hand of our God is on everyone who looks to him, but his great anger is against all who forsake him. So what then happened, verse 23? So we and petitioned our God about this. And guess what happened? So this is why it was mainstream. So you can think, maybe when the people are coming to ask Jesus, why is it that these people are fasting yours and not fasting, right? They, were, they had this deep conviction in their mind. No. The reason was very, very simple. John the Baptist people are fasting. The Pharisees are fasting. Okay, why aren't your people fasting? It was all about comparison. It was all about comparison. You see, who were John the Baptist? John the Baptist and John the Baptist and the Pharisees. John the Baptist and the Pharisees. Who are they? John the Baptist, right, is the guy we are told in Mark chapter one verse four. We are told that he lived in the wilderness. His clothing was made of camel's hair. He wore a leather belt. Around his waist, he ate locusts and wild honey. Turn to your neighbor and say, weird. Right? Very weird. Very weird. He was an, a, somewhat like an, what we call an ascetic, a spiritual person. So John the Baptist had these spiritual people. The Pharisees, on the other hand, they were a conservative Jewish sect within the normal Jewish religion. They, the meaning of Pharisees literally is the holy ones. So on one hand, you had these spiritual people. On the other hand, you had these very moral people, these holy people. And so they're like, if we can, how do we consider this Jesus and his movement? If we are to consider Jesus as a true leader, can we really take him seriously when he doesn't take spirituality and morality seriously? Because we know if you take spirituality and morality seriously, how much you should fast? Look at them. They are fasting, you are not fasting. Jesus, who are you? Now, the heart of it, I say again, is, as you can see, it's comparison. It has nothing to do with the fast itself. It is, are you better than these people? Or are you as good as they? Should we follow you if you don't take this thing seriously? It was all about peer pressure. And you know the thing about comparison, when you compare, when you do things based on comparison, there's nothing more self-centered than that. Because you're trying to see, validate yourself in some way by comparing yourself with somebody other, uh, with another person. It's self-centered. This fasting they were talking about, their motivation for fasting was self-centered. It was self-centered fasting. Did you hear that? It was self-centered fasting. Now, this self-centered fasting, if you practice it, it comes out with disastrous results disastrous result. I will explain. Now, before I tell you, in fact, two disastrous results, but before I do that, let me set it up. The thing about fasting is this. It recognizes the reality, a big reality, that at some point, gifts can distract us from givers. 
The gifts can, the gifts can distract us from a giver. I don't know, this happens with children all the time. You come, ah, Uncle Femi is here. Hey, look what I had for you. You bring out some chocolate, you bring out some sweet, you buy this. Ah, fantastic, Uncle Femi, great guy. Second time you come, ah, because you remember how those children were happy. You give them gifts. Hey, Uncle Femi is here. The third time you are coming, they are, shy. Uncle Femi has come. They will come and welcome you. Why? And when you don't say, let me hug you. Next thing you say, ah, what did you bring for us? At some point, they started to identify you with the thing that you gave them, not you yourself. They want to have a relationship with the gift, no longer what? The giver. Fasting helps us to recognize that the gift sometimes can distract you from the giver. And this is where fasting becomes an expression of freedom and dominion. Somebody say freedom and dominion. Because it recognizes that the gift has started to blur the sight of the giver. And so we also, we recognize sometimes, we recognize that God gives us, God is the one that gives us all blessings. But sometimes the blessings of God can start to distract us from the view of God. We, we start to want the blessings of God, not God himself. So fasting now says this, I have the freedom to consume this blessing of God. But because this blessing of God is beginning to put me in bondage, it's beginning to dominate me, I will exercise my freedom not to consume it to show that I have dominion over it. Who understands that? You have the freedom to take it, but as you've exercised your freedom to take it, over a period of time, the thing starts to have dominion over you. So in order for you to gain dominion over it, you say, I will now exercise my freedom not to take you. Fasting is about freedom and dominion. Is escaping from some kind of slavery. But here is the problem and the twisted nature of self-centered fasting. You drop one form of slavery only to pick up another. You drop one form of slavery only to pick up another. And it manifests in two different ways. Let me explain. One is superiority, the other one is inferiority. Let me explain with the superiority first. I have come to this conclusion, the philosophical conclusion, that the spirit of I better pass my neighbor runs through the heart of every Nigerian. It runs through all of us. If you've not found it, the only thing is this, it's just looking for the category in which you actually do better pass your neighbor. You may not have found it, don't worry, it's coming. And this thing is mostly it's the difference between, you can see this between secondary school and university. You see, in secondary school, if you really want to have any sense of worth or value, you need to find excellence in the three A's, one of the three A's. You need to be excellent academically, right? Athletically or aesthetically. Your grades, your sports, or your looks. You may not have all the, just have one. Maybe you are, you are bottom of the class. Maybe you don't know how to run. But you're fine. You understand? Guys are looking after you. So some, some of you, some of you, you had one of those. Some of you, God bless you, you had two. But if you had the burden of being me, and you had all three, what can you do? It was tough, it was tough. It was tough. You, know, you, you, you get all A's, it's time for high jump, you are scaling it, and then after you've scaled it, all the girls come to congratulate you. It's just, it's just, it's just tough times, tough times. But for some of you, you didn't have, you didn't excel in any of them. But wait for it, don't worry, there's redemption because not everybody, we don't all stay in secondary school, we eventually go to university. So what happens in university is that you found that you didn't have game athletically, you didn't have game academically, and you didn't have game aesthetically. Maybe you can have game spiritually. You see all those Ife people? <laughs> now God has caught you. This is why Ife people are the ones that can speak and talk for two to three hours. You don't go to class, you don't hang with babes, you don't go to the, um, to the, to the sports center, but you go to the quadrangle. 
That's where you go and pray, you want kabash. So what happens really is that when people cannot excel in any of those things, they now say, maybe I can excel religiously. You may try the intellectual part, that is the people that like to argue about theology, is that they didn't have game in any of those three things. But some of them that can't do it intellectually, they find another route on the religious end. It's not the intellectual one. They go the spiritual discipline one. And that is where fasting lifts you high. Have you not noticed that when it comes to fasting, if we are honest, we, full, we are fixated on three big questions. Just three big questions. What not to take? When do I break? How long to partake? What not to take? If you are at the highest level, because some of you say, ah, I don't do food, but you drink water. But when you do dry fast, huh, dry, nothing. When do we break? Some of you, by God's grace, you ah, wish I did 12, Sha. <laughs> but when you are, you know, you are average, six. But some of you, you know, you can do 9 p.m. Some of you, it's like, ah, no, we don't. I don't I go to the next day. I go to the next day. It's just. <laughs> but then for how long? For some of you, it's like, ah, one day. Church said one week. Some people, they are doing two months. That's why, you see, when you see, the, the, the height of it was Jesus. Yeah, Jesus, 40 days dry fast. 40 days dry fast, no breaking. So we, we self center fasting. We start to fixate on those things. Let me not lie to you. I did 21 days fast one time. This is like almost, uh, almost 20 years ago, uh, 2006. 21 days fast. It wasn't dry. But I was only breaking with granite and banana. 9 p.m. There's nobody that came around me that did not know I did that fast. <laughs> I, I, what, what are you talking about? I, you, you needed to know. I've only done it once in my life, by the way. I've never done it again since. And so what we do is that we are trying to use fasting as a way to show our spiritual prowess. It's a way to validate that we do matter. Even if I don't have it, I don't have money. Even if I don't have athletic, I don't have any of these things. At least... I they can't quit with this fasting. This is the message that Tenny was trying to send to us and we didn't listen. If my papa no be dangote or adeleke, if I fast, te te, I go de okay. That's what she was saying. She stole the lyrics from me, don't worry. Superiority. And so you now start... He's just catching it. Oh, my God. <laughs> Father, Lord, we bind every spirit of delay in your people's lives. The spirit that enables us to... We don't see the opportunities when they come, and it just passes us by. All right, superiority. So what we use fasting for is to look down on other people. The Pharisees were going around and saying, what kind of person? This person doesn't fast. Who are you? Disastrous results. But you see, the flip side is the inferiority. You've been rejected from many groups over a period of time. You've been rejected from academic groups. You were never at the top in the class or among the top people. They didn't want you around there. You are not part of the good-looking girls in, at, in secondary school. You are not part of the sporty people. And so you decide, okay, now university, let me join the religious people. Let me show that at least, you know, I can do something. And so now they said they were fasting for three days. You could only do one day. They said every day we'll meet at 9 to break. You had broken at 3 o'clock. And at some point, they start saying, are you even a serious Christian? And you two start saying, am I really one? And once you find that you couldn't fit in with that group, at some point, the rejection of that group is not just the rejection of the group. All of a sudden, you start to say, if the group will not accept me, how do I know that God truly even accepts me? And so for some people, fasting that was meant to be a spiritual discipline, that was meant to bring life, it ends up injuring people with a fragile conscience. Guys, if you engage in this kind of self-centered fasting, it always leads to disastrous results. And for those of us who maybe have felt in the inferiority group, and because of this, you have given up on fasting. Let me tell you this, Jesus did not approve of this kind of fasting. I don't blame you. 
Because Jesus did not approve of this kind of fasting because it was not about comparison. When John the Baptist's uh, people were fasting and the Pharisees' disciples were fasting, Jesus' people were not fasting. As I said, I don't blame you. But that takes me to my second point. Desirous fasting. So Jesus understands everything that these people are doing. And he said, we will not engage in it. Jesus understands all the problems that you've gone through more than even what you know. And so you're like, well, since Jesus is on my side, that's why I don't really fast. Look at verse 20, the last three line, uh, verses, um, words of verse 20. They will fast. Can I say this? If you've experienced abuse in fasting, if you've experienced wrong teaching in fasting, and as a result of that, you start to argue that we don't really need to fast. Can I say, good for you, but please don't cite Jesus as your guy. Jesus is not backing you with this. Jesus is not your guy. You see, fasting was, along with prayer and Alms giving, giving to the needy, it formed the three pillars of Jewish spirituality of that day. And in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus addresses those three spiritual pillars. In verse 2, he says, So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as. Verse 5, when you pray, do not be like. Verse 16, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do. Now listen. In this context, it's the same thing he's talking about, right? The same um, chapter on the Sermon on the Mount. How many of you believe that we should still give to the needy today as Christians? How many of you believe that we should still be praying today as Christians? If you believe that, how can you now not believe that we shouldn't fast? Jesus, notice, did not say, if you fast. He says what? When you fast. Because Jesus recognized, apart from the other two big, big categories I spoke about, Jesus recognized there are even other uses for fasting. For instance, this is one sin that a lot of us don't talk about in our modern age, and it is there. I've suffered from it myself. The sin of gluttony. For most of Christian, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the existence of Christianity, it was one of the biggest sins, gluttony. In Proverbs 23, verse 1 to 3, it addresses, it said, when you sit to dine with a ruler, note well what is before you. Put a knife to your throat if you are giving to, verse 3, do not crave his delicacies for that food is deceptive. So fasting helps us with defeating the sin of gluttony, but also it helps us with spiritual discernment and commissioning for ministry. You see, in Acts chapter 13, Paul and Barnabas were in a church called the Church of Antioch. And there was a time when the leaders were, what happened? While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart. It was in that context that they heard the voice of the Spirit and the world, the Roman world, in fact, the whole world has never been the same since. Because what happened after? Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. This is what birthed the modern missionary movement. In fact, this was the birth of true what? Frontier ministry, going out into all the world. So they heard whilst they were fasting. But guess what? When it was time to commission, how do you think they did it? So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. In fact, in one of the churches they now planted, when they were choosing elders, after they chosen elders, because of the same way they were commissioned through fasting and prayer, in verse 14, uh, 23 of chapter 14, Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. So Jesus was not going to come against fasting. He saw many reasons for fasting. But if you notice, go back to that Matthew 6, 2, uh, Matthew 6 5, uh, 2, 5 and whatever. You, notice what Jesus did. There's a formula there. Have you seen it? He says, the formula is this. When you do not. When you do not. He knows that you can abuse giving to the poor. He knows that you can abuse prayer. He knows that you can abuse fasting. But in saying and identifying that you can abuse them, Jesus is saying this, I am not telling you to abolish them. Because he still says, when you, I expect you to do them. 
but do not do it like this. In other words, Jesus is saying, even though they may have abused it, the abuse does not invalidate its proper use. So what Jesus is doing is this. I am not going to abolish these things for the improper use. I am going to reform them. So Jesus is about the reforming of fasting. And at the heart of the reformation of fasting, Jesus points to the very core reason for fasting. That's what this passage is about. What is the core reason for fasting? Remember, I've given you many other reasons for fasting, but they are not the primary reason, the biblical reason for fasting. They are not the, it's not the main cause of fasting. What is the main cause of fasting? The main reason for fasting, very simple. We fast for God's presence. We fast to get more of God. Let me explain. Verse 20. Let's go to verse 19 and 20. Notice. He tells a short parable here. Jesus answers, he answered the question that they asked him. Why is it that your people are not fasting? And he says, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, they cannot, let's read that together. They cannot so long as they have him with them. Now go to verse 20. Let's read it together too. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be and ah. so the critical element as per whether or not you will fast is the presence of the bridegroom. Did you see it? If the bridegroom is present, no, you don't fast. If the bridegroom is no longer present, oh, you will fast. Now, in this parable, Jesus is identifying himself as the bridegroom and his disciples as the guests of the bridegroom. But any Jewish thinking, scripturally thinking person at that time would say, ah, there's a problem here. Because who is the bridegroom? Normally, if, if you read the Old Testament, well, normally you can check this. One reference is Hosea 2, verse 19 to 20. But a very, very quick verse is Isaiah 62, verse 5. Who do they, represent, who do they see as the bridegroom? As a young man marries a young woman, so will your builder marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will who? Your God. So Israel understood that in their covenant relationship with Yahweh, Yahweh was their bridegroom. And anyone, and please don't miss this, this is really important. Anyone who, in the Old Testament, who was in right, favorable, and covenantal standing, right, favorable, and covenantal standing with Yahweh, anyone that was in right, favorable, and covenantal, covenantal standing with Yahweh, in the presence of Yahweh, do you know what they do? They don't fast, they always eat. Oh, let me show you this. I'll give you three examples. In Exodus chapter, uh, Exodus chapter 24, verse 11, after they had just ratified what we call the Mosaic Covenant, the elders, the representatives of Israel, look at what he says in verse 11. They saw God and they did what? Ate and drank. When, people, when Moses, uh, David had collected offerings, a lot of offerings for the temple that Solomon was going to build, and they were all rejoicing, they got the Levites and the priests and they were making sacrifices. And verse 22 of 1 Chronicles 29, it says, they ate and drank with great joy. Where? When Ezekiel anticipates the final temple and the entrance that only the God of Israel comes in and also only the prince, the Messiah comes in. You know what it says in Ezekiel 44 verse 3? The prince himself is the only one who may sit inside the gateway to do what? Whenever you are in a right covenantal standing with God, when you are in his presence, you don't fast, you what? You eat. How can they fast when the bridegroom is with them? Because what happens in the presence of the Lord, Isaiah 25 verse 6, on this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast, a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats, and the finest of wines. In God's presence, when you are in right standing with him, you don't fast, you only eat. But when he's taken away from you, you are no longer in the place where you can feast. And in that day, they will fast. Because, don't miss the connection, fasting is all about feasting. Fasting is all about what? Feasting. 
It is that when we were in God's presence, we were feasting. Now we are no longer in God's presence. We are fasting so that we can feast once again. Is somebody getting me? You see, this is where you cannot make abstinence and fasting the same thing. Can I point to some people who say that when they are trying to gain weight, they say they are fasting. You are not fasting. When you are trying to, get, uh, when you are trying to lose weight, sorry, you say that you start to, you are not. Just say, I am abstaining from food to lose weight. Because biblical fasting, remember in the presence of God, there are all this food. Biblical fasting has its sole purpose for you, not to lose weight, but for you to gain weight, but to gain the weight of the glory of God's presence. Oh, David understood this maybe more than most people. In Psalm 63, verse 1 to 5, I just want to run through that because it's such a powerful scripture. <coughs> Notice, he says, you, you, God, are my God. Earnestly do I what? Seek you. The reason he's seeking him is what? He says, I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. You know one of the sad realities that we have as we grow intellectually, as we grow, maybe we go to school, you have college degrees and everything. Your Christianity starts to reflect that way of thinking. You start to think that Christianity is all about thinking. So when you say I'm longing for God, you start thinking that I'm just longing to fill my mind with knowledge. Or you think the solution is teach me more doctrine. And that is not that learning more teachings about God is not important. It is, but it's not the only thing. When David says, my whole being longs for God, he understands that his being is not just his mind. It's also his body. So he calls his mind and his body to show solidarity with the hunger of his spirit. You are made not just as a mind. You are made as a mind and body. And so when you long for God, you can't just long with your mind. He says that I thirst, I thirst. My whole body longs for you. Is that where you are? Fasting is a way of trying to tell your body to express what you are feeling deep inside your soul. In verse, two, in verse 3, he says the reason why he's saying that is because he has learned that God's love is better than life itself. Because of that, my lips will glorify you. Can I ask... Don't lie to yourself. Have you experienced the love of God in that way where you can say it is better than life? You see, it is because David had experienced that before. He is now longing for God. How do we know? Look at verse 2. In verse 2 he says, I have, in times past, I have seen you in the sanctuary. I beheld your power and your glory, but I don't have it again. And so what is happening? I am longing for it. Lord, I am longing for you. Is this your desperate heart cry? When it is your desperate heart cry, when the presence of God that you've experienced before is no longer with you, you say, look, I want to feast in that your presence, Lord. I want to feast in that your presence. And so I will forgo this food in my body just to express that I long for you. My desperate need, the thing I need the most, Lord, is you. That's why in verse 5, it tells us there are things that can satisfy us, but only for a moment. You don't get true satisfaction unless you're in the presence of God. It says, I will be. If I can get you, I will be fully, fully satisfied. As, oh, I love this phrase, with the richest of foods. The richest of foods. Oh, there was a song we we'll stop that because it's stopping the tune. It's an old song by a guy called Bob Fitt. He says, I cannot live without your love, O oh Lord. I cannot breathe without your breath. I cannot sing without your song, O oh Lord, ringing deeply in my breast. Where can I go from your presence, Lord? You are with me all of my days. From my deepest despair to the highest place, I will remain here in the shadow of your face. Where can we go from the presence of the Lord? There is no greater feeling there is no greater thing than to enjoy his presence and be filled with the richest of foods. The richest of foods. 
I don't know about you, but when I think about the richest of foods, it has to satisfy me aesthetically. It has to satisfy me from the place of taste. And then it has to nourish me. It has to do those three things whilst it is quenching my hunger. And you know, sometimes when I think about the richest of foods, I think about going to a French restaurant and a chef, probably a Michelin star chef, is running it. And I go in there and I ask, What's your poisson de jour? And so oh, today we are having a loup de mer. It's like, you know, you are, that's fish. But some of you don't like fish. And so maybe they offered you the most tender duck confit sprinkled with a generous homemade jus fondeville. Oh my God, my, I'm, I'm bubbling right now. And if you decide to go all the way with the dessert, if you're like me, that likes tart, what if they offered you tart, tart, tart? Oh, the richest of foods. But if they said that you could get that if you just waited for six hours and then somebody just comes around and just says, I can quit your hunger now. Take pizza and chips. I know some of you lazy people that already say, eh, pizza and chips is okay. May God bind you from the spirit of poverty. Ah, come on. In many ways, guys, let me tell you, this is what fasting is about. God is, said, I have, God is saying, I have set a table before you with the richest of foods. The richest of food that you can only get in my presence. And so what we do with fasting is to say, I am going to set this food aside. I am exercising my liberty and my freedom because there was something I once had. Now maybe you are here and you've never had it before. And he said, this is the thing that can satisfy you the most. And so he said, I'm putting it away so that I can get the richest of foods. May God restore such a hunger in this house today. richest of foods. And so he says, well, it seems like David already had a good revelation of this. So why do we need Jesus? What does Jesus bring to the table? Well, let me tell you, what Jesus brings to the table is what David wanted, but he offers it in a way that David could never get. So when David is saying God or he's saying Yahweh, my God, that's good. But Jesus is saying, I can give you the chance not to just say God, but I can give you the chance to say my Father. Oh, it's a deeper relationship. And with that deeper relationship, it's deeper experiences. That's what verses 21 and verse 22 are about. That's what those two short parables, those two short parables are saying the same thing. The first one is this. It's saying you had this cloth that you've been wearing for such a long time. Eventually, there was a tear in the cloth. It's an old cloth. But then you sew a patch of new cloth to it. Now, every, I know most of us will know this. Whenever you buy new clothes, you don't wash them immediately because you know what's going to happen after you wash them. What happens? They shrink. And so imagine you use the new cloth to actually sew the patch. Once you, sew, once you wash it, what happens? Eventually, it shrinks. And when it shrinks beyond the part that you are trying to cover, the thing then tears further and then the old one tears and the new one tears as well. Both of them are ruined. When you try to merge something new on something old, both of them get ruined. It's the same thing. If you get new wine and you put it in an old wine skin, eventually what happens? The new wine starts to ferment and bring gas. Eventually it bursts the old wine skin that was brittle. Do you understand? If you try, Jesus is saying, if you try to merge a new thing with an old thing, eventually both of them will come to ruin. And so Jesus is basically saying something that was once serviceable, in this point, he's talking about the old covenant and everything that comes within it. Something that was once serviceable is destroyed and made worthless when trying to merge it with a new thing. Listen to me. Jesus was saying, I am not just bringing a new way of fasting. I'm bringing a new era. And if you try to bring things and ways from the old era and try and bring it into this my new era, it will not work. But if you embrace this my new era, 
then you will embrace the blessings of my new era as well. How does it do it? How does it do it? I don't know how many of you have been to a wedding recently. But in my own wedding, I remember my wife and I, because we did the traditional the day before. We were already tired going into the wedding. And you're going to do church wedding. In our church tradition, they prayed for us, prayed and prophesied. When I was trying to pray and prophesy, it was about 45 to 50 minutes. Exactly, exactly, exactly. My knees were about to give way. So the service itself was like three hours. We are tired. So we just knew once we get to that reception, and you know all those devilish people that want you to dance from beginning to... I know some of you are here. Some of you are here. God is watching. God is watching you. Make people dance from all the way. From. They can come like this. No, they must go that way. Come like this. Come that way. Come like this. Try to do, do it with us. We are tired. So we had already set our minds. Oh. Once they do can get all these the things we are going. Everybody can dance. They can do anything they want. I say they have now people do that one on steroids. Whether the bridegroom or the groom, uh, the bridegroom and the bride are there or not, we are partying all the way to the night. In Jesus' time, that's not the way it was. Though. In Jesus' time, actually, the last people to leave was the bride and the groom. All the guests that met them there will leave them so that they are saying, we are living into this your new life. So that if the bridegroom was not there at the end, there's only one thing it could mean. The bridegroom was forcibly taken away. But the time will come, verse 20, when the bridegroom will be taken away. Jesus knew in trying to establish his new era, he had to be forcibly taken away. Guys, you know what that forcibly taken away was? He was talking about his death. But what was he achieving with his death? There were people that would cry, Lord, I'm thirsty for you, I'm hungry for you, but they could not guarantee they could come to the presence of their father. But on the cross, because we who thirst, we try to drink from so many fountains, fountain of romance, fountain of money, fountain of a career, fountain of social media, all of these things that the Bible will call sin, Jesus on the cross said in John chapter 19 verse 28, I thirst. And when Jesus said, I thirst, the Father did not respond to him so that he could pay for all our sins and open up a way for us so that when we with fasting say, Lord, I thirst for you, you can guarantee that he will answer you. He thirsted and hungered on the cross so that you will not have to thirst ever more again. Do you understand? He offers you a new era. That's why he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. When he opens up that new era for us, then we can do things with our Father. Then we can experience the richest of food. Then we can really have a relationship. We can dance with our Father. You say, what is so good about this? And I don't know how to explain it to you by being the presence of God, but I can... For those of us who are in relationships, for those of us who are in marriages, maybe the ones that are very good, or you have best of friends. Even when you meet with some of your best of friends that you've not met with in a long time, and somebody says, why were you so happy? And you say, ah, we talked, we talked about the old days, we talked about, eh, hey, hey, you just laughed about, it's not, it's not about that, it's, there's something about the bond that you share, that just being in the presence of that person, it fills you with so much joy. Guys, God is that presence, that best friend that we have been looking for for such a long time. When we are in his presence, Lord, guys, we eat the richest of foods. We can dance with our Father. Some of you that know me um, a little bit will know that one of my favorite singers of all time, I should be one of your favorite singers of all time, the guy called Luther Vandross. A man had a heavenly voice as far as I'm concerned. And he sang so many great songs, Power of Love. He did some great duets with some people, Endless Love, well, Endless Love Remake with Maya Carey. So amazing. Oh, such a wonderful song. But I want to share something that happened in the last three years of Luther Vandross's life. 
In 2005, he died. But in 2004, he won the Grammy. Well, he won four Grammys, but he won the Grammy for Song of the Year for a song that he wrote in 2003. You see, the evangelist used to reminisce about when he was a child. And sometimes he spoke about how, in this song, he spoke about how he would get into an argument with his mom. And when he got into the argument with his mom and they are both arguing, he would run away from his mom and he would run to his father. And he said, you know what the father will do? The father will make him laugh. And in that making him laugh, he will comfort him. And when he comforts him, he then enables him to do what the mother had actually wanted him to do. He said, occasionally, when he'll go to bed and sleep, his father will put a dollar under his pillow. He said that when he used to dance with his father, that was his greatest memory. The father will throw him up, throw him down, throw him up. And then mom will be there. Then he will dance with the mom. Then he will come back to him. He will spin him around. And eventually, after he was tired, the father will carry him up the staircase. He won't even know when he fell asleep. He said, at those points with his father, he felt loved. He knew he was loved. His father died when he was eight years old. And in 2003, at the age of 52, he is still thinking about dancing with his father. And so he wrote this lyric. He said, If I could get another chance, another walk, another dance with him, I'd play a song that will never end. How I'd love, love, love to dance with my father again. That's over 40 years after he was still longing to have that experience. You know, the saddest part for me in that song is not only was he aching to dance with his father again, in fact, he was mourning the absence of his father more for his mom than for him. So at some point, he enters into a prayer towards the end. He says, I know I am praying for much too much, but could you send back the only man she loved? I know you don't do it usually, but dear Lord, she's dying to dance with my father again. I know there are some of us here with the loss of our fathers, or maybe you didn't have a good father. You still have that nagging ache. And you say, if I could get a chance with my good father, the father I've always imagined, I will play a song that will never, ever end. And I just want to say, oh, Luther, oh, Luther, oh, Luther, there is a father that is greater than that father. And what you think he does not do usually, he actually does all the time. And the song that you think will never ever end, he's saying that I have angels that are playing that song because my son died for you to come and dance with the Father again. Guys, do you understand what Jesus has done for us? He's saying this, there are times when we don't have the presence of the Lord, but because he has opened the way for us, we can always dance with our Father again. And what we do with fasting is not a way of looking down on people. It's not a way to express our spiritual powers. It's a way to say that the thing that I long for and I need the most, I can get again if I can just enter your presence. I hunger and I thirst for more. More of you, more of you, more of you. I want more of you. I want more of you, Jesus, the more I want you, the more I want to know you, Jesus, more of you. I want more of you, one more time. I want more of you, I want more of you. He's here. Not had enough of him. If you've tasted him before, he's saying he can give himself to you again. 
The Father is here for you to dance with Him. He makes our life so beautiful. You make my life so beautiful. Because of Jesus, we are like Him. What more is greater than this? about my third point with this general fasting I do want to say something I want to invite us this holy week that we are beginning I want to invite us as a church I want us to fast as a church it's not a fast for some kind of breakthrough in your finances may God meet that in the name of Jesus it's not even a fast to just restore your relationship to all of those things all of those things are important it's not just for discernment no it's not for a national tragedy. No, they are all important. But I want to invite us for a fast. A fast as we move towards Easter. As we move towards the time when Jesus opened up a way for us to the Father. Can we say, Jesus, we need you. As you walked or as you came in to Jerusalem on that pole, can you ride into my heart? That there is more of you that I have not experienced. I want to experience you. And so for in this period, in this week, I'm going to put away that which you have given to me. I'm going to exercise my freedom. I'm going to exercise my dominion to see renewal in my life. To see renewal in the life of the church. To see renewal so that we can dance with the Father again. So I'm inviting us for that fast. Now listen. Here's what I'm not going to tell you. Do we break our six? That's up to you. Can I take water? If that's going to make you complete it, please do. Can I take tea with honey so that at least I can work and I don't have... Please, you are free. The important thing here is that you are forgoing something and you are telling your body to show solidarity with your spirit and your soul. That's what's most important. One more of him. But one more thing. We're still going to say one more thing. When we do this fast, I want us to do this fast in a way that God would choose. Because there is a fast that God has not chosen. In Isaiah chapter 58 verses 3 to 5, God shows the people that they are fasting. They are wondering why their prayers are not being answered. And God says, this is the fast I have chosen. He says, when you people fast, you do as you please and you exploit all your workers. Verse 4, he says, your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Verse 5, he then says this, is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast? Is it acceptable to the Lord? It's not just about what you do because if we truly fast the way the world wants, you know what? It will work out in a generous spirit. The problem, the indictment that God put on them, verse 6 and verse 7, he says this, 
this is, is, this, is this not the kind of fast I have chosen to lose the chains of injustice and untie the cord of the yoke to set your press free and break every yoke? How can we do that? Verse 7. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter and when you see the naked to clothe them and not turn away from your own flesh and blood? Listen, maybe I can explain this way. Just put the music down a little bit more. When somebody has something, when somebody is very rich, do you know the ultimate test of whether or not you are rich and wealthy? It is not how much you are able to store. It is how much you are able to give. There are very many people who call rich and wealthy people, they are very poor because they are unable to give. Generosity is the ultimate test that you have no need of anything. And the greatest currency that we need is not money, is not the love of a spouse, is not the love of children. No, the greatest currency that we all need is the love of God. That is the greatest currency we all need. Now remember I said that if you are truly full, you have nothing to store, you keep giving. God is the one person in the world, uh, the one being in the world that is full of God's love, isn't he? And so in Acts chapter 17, verse 25, he shows us that God has no need of anything, anything, and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, because he has no need of anything, what does he do? He himself, what? Gives. He gives everyone life and breath and everything else. And so when Jesus, the God-man, came, he did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many and so in 1 john 3 16 17 18 he says this is how we know what love is jesus christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters how do we demonstrate this if you truly have love he says this if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them how can the love of god be in that person you know that you hear what i'm saying if we are going to fast for the love of God which is a spiritual thing if God feeds us spiritually whilst we are keeping our material things aside the true test is whether we have that love is not whether we keep those material things to pick them up again it is whether we give them out verse 18 dear children let us not love with words or speech but with actions and in truth so guys here's the first two things we will do Either the food that you are meant to eat, you take that food, you cook, and you go and give to people that you have. Fasting is not an economic saving activity. It provides economic loving opportunity. So you take the food that you would have eaten. Some of you, you have to cook. Go and give your gate man. Go and give the people around. Now, you may not be able to do that. So what, here's what you will do. Calculate the money that you would have spent on eating. And say, because God has generously given to me spiritually, I am now going to give others who don't have as well. I will give to them materially. This is how we show that the love of God is in us. As we pursue, Paul says, that you being rooted in love, I pray that you can grasp the height, the length, the depth, the breadth of the love of God that passes knowledge and be filled with all the fullness of God. Guys, I can assure you, as we thirst for more of God, as we thirst for more of God, as we hunger for God, He will fill us with His love. Let us pour that love out to people. He has made us so colorful. 